Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Developer Express. Become a UI superhero with Dev Express controls and libraries. Deliver Elegant.net solutions that address customer needs today by leveraging your existing knowledge. You can build next-generation touch-enabled solutions for tomorrow. You can download your free 30-day trial at dx.hanselminutes.com. That's dx.hanselminutes.com. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 556. In this episode, Scott talks with Amir Rajan about being a polyglot programmer. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, I'm talking with Amir Rajan. Uh, he was actually on the show with his number one um, iPhone, iOS app in the App Store. How, how's that app doing? Uh, it's doing well. Um, it's got a really long tail. This is one of those weird things where it's, it, at first, I thought it was one and done, but it's being able, it's sustaining uh, its, its um, spot. So, it's still like in the top 10 in the RPG section. It's not number one anymore, but it's it's up there. And I recently uh, deployed to Android, and it hit the number uh, seven spot overall on Android, but it's come down since then. So I have to kind of see, you know, how it's gonna how it's gonna uh, wade through on Android. Uh, it's just too 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 soon to tell, right? At this point, mm-hmm. that show was kind of widely circulated and very well thought of because you were super transparent about it. And you're just like, yeah, you know, this is what it's like to have a number one app in the App Store. Um, and I know you had a partner and you had some help and uh, there was some, you know, the pie gets chopped up. But did it make you uh, like a multi-bajillionaire, like Flappy Bird guy? Uh, I can do, I, I, I consider myself a game developer now. That's like actually my profession. So when people ask me, what do I do for a living? I say, hey, I'm a game dev. And uh, it doesn't shut, shut down the conversation like uh, I'm a software engineer, right? The moment you mm-hmm. say you're a software engineer, it's like, oh, God, <laughs> let's talk about something else. Uh, so I, I actually say I'm a game dev. Um, I do it, uh, I guess, part-time, and then the other time I do independent consulting here and there. So cool. um, when, when I have an interesting idea, I'll, I'll go away and do some game development. If not, then I'll uh, keep my skills sharp and you know go out into the world and help out, help out as much as I can. I actually have a book now, too, uh, called Surviving the App Store where I basically take all the wisdom I've gotten over this three-year period and kind of put it out there for indie de- game developers. That's very cool. People should definitely check that out as well as the podcast. It really dem- demystified things, especially from the financial perspective. I just kind of assumed that it was like, you know, 50 grand a day and it just keeps rolling in and then you just hang out on a beach. And it's not quite as glamorous as that, but uh, it is pretty exciting when millions of people download your game. Yeah, it's fun. I'm at 2.5 million downloads at this point. 2.5 million. That's yep. amazing. Yep. Half of those are free, but 2.5 mm-hmm. million. So what language did you write that in? Uh, that was actually written in Ruby. Uh, which is kind of weird. I actually started. How does that in, work? <laughs> hey, yeah, how, like, that how the hell does that work? Uh, so I actually started in Objective C, and uh, you know, I came from C sharp. I quit my job, decided to build a video game, started in Objective C. Uh, it was interesting. I, I learned some things about Objective C, but then I went to Ruby and Ruby Motion, and I built my game in Ruby Motion. Uh, so the games built in Ruby. All my other games are built in Ruby, also. Um, I'm starting to look at Cocos 2DX, which is a C, uh, C, C++ uh, game framework. And uh, I'm starting to write actual, like a Ruby bridge. Uh, so C bridge to Ruby, so I can continue doing things in Ruby. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it's it's so weird, like, just, just, how I, just to kind of get into this uh, idea of, you know, getting through all these languages. Um, I actually started doing Ruby as a build automation tool for C Sharp. So uh, we use something called Albacore. Uh, this was back in 2010, and Albacore was uh, made um, by by the guy that did uh, Backbone Marionette. Um, his name his name ex- uh, Derek Bailey. That's it. So Derek Bailey uh, actually built Albacore to build .NET solutions. So my uh, initial uh, initial introduction to Ruby wasn't actually through Rails at all. It was just being a Rubyist building objects and constructs around the concepts of build. And, um, and, uh, building.net solutions. 
And so I really liked Ruby from that standpoint. And then that's when I decided it was like, well, you know, I've done enough of the corporate stuff. Let me go ahead and do some, do some independent self study and exploration of, of all these different wonderful things out there. So when I thought of iPhone development, I just assumed it was Swift or, or Objective C. But when you poke around anywhere, whether it be Mac or Windows or Android or iPhone, there's always the mainstream thing, the mainstream language. But then there are really way more alternate languages for platforms you wouldn't have expected. I never would have said, oh, yeah, Ruby, uh, iPhone development, 100%. You know, but if you go to rubymotion.com, you know, there you are on the homepage under success stories. You know, like I'm, I'm shocked. There's a whole universe out there of people doing Ruby on iPhone. So does this mean that pretty much any language is available on pretty much any platform? Like people love their language and they just do whatever it takes to make it happen on that platform. You know, I, I feel like it's starting to get that way. And, uh, you know, just just even with Unity, that's something that, you know, I, I love to look at, too. There's a lot of C-sharp of Unity, of course. That's the default language. Uh, but there's another thing called Arcadia, which is a closure wrapper on Unity. So, you know, people are doing taking the languages that they enjoy working with and bringing it to the platforms that they want to work in. And uh, it's really cool to see that. Um, uh, I think I think uh, that wouldn't be the case. I would I would even say like ten years ago, uh, where that would just be very difficult. You just have the language and the platform you want to work in. You have to use language X Y Z, and there was no real option outside of that. Um, mm-hmm. So it's it's cool. It's really neat to see that. Uh, there's another language called Kotlin, uh, which is being used on um, Android. I haven't personally taken a look at it. But you have these all these small little uh, examples of people bringing in languages that they care about and they like working in to the platforms that they want to work in. Yeah. Um, although I would have to, I mean, acting as kind of the advocate for the, the people who are listening right now, because right. I'm kind of their, their voice, you know, they're hearing Kotlin, Scala, Clojure, Groovy. Uh, it might sound pretty foreign as they're driving to their their text boxes over data job that they're doing right now in whatever language they've been doing for the last five or 10 years. Um, it, they might be thinking, you know, I'm, I'm not really that person. I'm not the computer science, fancy, learn a multiple language type thing. You know, they read all these blog posts about be a polyglot. I'm using five languages every day. And uh, it sounds exhausting almost. It can be. And it, and for me, uh, I guess just being an independent consultant, that's, that's kind of the burden I have to take upon myself. Um, I, I have to just being a, a lone developer, quote unquote, beat the averages. Uh, there's a, there's an essay on, uh, hackers and painters and it's about beating the averages. He specifically talks about Lisp as, uh, as a language. I think Brad Abrams, uh, talks about Lisp as a language and how he built Yahoo checkout to, um, or he built a checkout system that competed with Yahoo's checkout system in Lisp while everyone else was doing things in C. And, uh, how quickly he was able to create, create this kind of stuff was, was amazing. They, they actually, there were points where people were saying, you are stealing our code or you've got some kind of insider mole that is telling you what our features are because there's no way that you could have built XYZ that quickly. Mm-hmm. So for, for, from a personal, personal standpoint, I have to beat the averages. I have to look for, best of breed and think about ideas and, you know, different ways just, just so I can bring that expertise to, you know, a company that might be trying to integrate two languages together or try to adopt, um, they do an acquisition and they're like, okay, well, we've got this code base in language X and we have this other code base in language Z and two teams that don't know how to communicate off, you know, across that language gap. Uh, how do we, what do we do? How do we make this, uh, merger successful? So for me, it's, it's a personal, um, personal effort that I have to put in. You did, I want to slow down one second though. You did say you kind of threw out hackers and painters. Are you referring to Paul Graham's book? Paul Graham's book. Sorry. Yeah. Not Brad Abrams, Paul Graham. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah, So hackers and painters, big ideas in the computer age is a series of essays, uh, by Paul Graham and it's available on uh, Kindle for just a couple of bucks. Yeah. And there's a a specific essay in there called beating the averages. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, I see, I, th- do you think that it's the world's getting split into the polyglot and the non polyglot? Cause, you know, when I, when I travel, I meet people, uh, there was this joke actually, I, where was I? I was in Paris and they were talking about how, you know, if you're, uh, you can be bilingual or trilingual or you can be American. 
You right. Know, that's like, that's kind of the way of thinking. Is the world splitting like that where there's people who speak Java, Python, Scala, Node, C sharp, and then there's C sharp developers? Uh, I think it's, I think the, the amount of language that you need to know to consider yourself a polyglot, I think that bar has dropped personally for mm-hmm. me. So it's, it's not about knowing all the inner workings of, of let's say Ruby, uh, Ruby and, uh, the Egan class and how to, how to, get method missing to do exactly what you want, right? That's a, that's a lot of depth there for a specific language. So for me, it's kind of like you can use the language well enough to perform a non-trivial task. So can you, uh, my definition for well enough might be, can you expose a REST API that uh, saves to a data store of some type? Um, and can you do that idiomatically in that language and, sp- and speak to, speak to, you know, whatever approach that might be? Uh, so I think that's a component of it. Um, being able to, uh, uh, there's a lot of information online now too. So I think that really helps generally speaking in knowing a language quote unquote well enough. So, um, that helps lower that, th- lower that barrier to entry and lower that bar. Um, yeah. What is well enough though, right? Like, you know, I took four or five years of Spanish in in high school mm-hmm. and i can order chipotle like a beast but if we start talking about like like what is it like the you know past present participle or whatever you know like i would have possibly in the future maybe have done this tense then it's like whoa 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 you know and i feel the same way when i start using you know javascript right and it's subjective from that standpoint um for me uh, as far as when i try to pick up a new language uh, first thing i'll do is Read the language spec, right? What's the language specification? Uh, what are they trying to convey from the language? What's the high level, um, ideas of the language itself? And then after that, I've got a, a suite of sample apps that I build out. Um, one of them is like a word finder. Basically, I build a website. You put in some, uh, random characters like a regex or, uh, some question marks saying that it contains, starts with an A, has five characters, ends with a Z. Give me all the words that are available in that, in that, uh, in that vicinity, primarily so I can beat my wife at words with friends. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's kind of one of my sample apps that I build out in a specific language. And I say, okay, well, can I build the sample app? Um, as far as well enough, I, I think I've kind of gotten to a point where it's where if you have, I would say 160 hours of development with that language. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a good month of full time development in that language. Um, you're, you're at a non trivial point of understanding and being able to speak to that language. That seems quite, that seems surprisingly short. Yeah. And, and it goes back to that bar, right? I, I'm not saying that you have to be exceptional and just know the inner workings of a specific language. It's, it's about, you can speak to it at a non-trivial level and do something, uh, do something with it, right? It's more than just print out hello world. Mm-hmm. I, I sometimes split up what I, I think about it in the context of what I need to know what I should know, what would be nice to know, and then what starts to get trivia, you know, if I kind of draw, and I have to just draw a line, I have to decide, I am not going to be esoteric, swift language person. Right, right. And that's fair. And even even with my own, uh, when I decide to pick a language uh, to learn, it's, there's components to it. There's, it's not just about the, the study of the language. I still consider myself extremely proficient and quote unquote expert level at C Sharp, Ruby, and JavaScript. Those are my three most marketable languages. Um, I have proficiency. I would say I'm, you know, intermediate proficient, intermediately proficient in like F Sharp and Closure. Uh, but those fall at a, you know, they're at a different level than, than with C Sharp. But I can speak to people, you know, in, in each, any one of those languages and paradigms. Mm-hmm. And uh, you just have to, you, sometimes you got to pick. And, um, as you learn more languages, you get better at, kind of figuring out, wait, what other language should I learn? So an example would be, I know Ruby really well. I can learn Python, uh, but I could probably gain more from learning a different language just because Ruby and Python are kind of close to each other. There, there are differences, but, um, I will, but they're if, in the family, they're like in the, they're G in the sharp family. and Java. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, you, you just get better at, better at doing stuff now, like specifically with JavaScript, um, that has been a bittersweet. I have a, I have a love hate relationship with JavaScript. And, you know, it's, it's that tricky area where do I, uh, so th- these are just to touch on some of the aspects of organizing a language. Do I see JavaScript as a class oriented language 
or do I see it as a functional language? So um, I try to emphasize using the word class-oriented because uh, saying object-oriented seems too general to me, and uh, especially with the experience that I have now. So uh, Java, so a class, I see a class as a me as a factory method for generating an object. It's a specific type of method. It's a specific type of technique for generating an object. But at the end of the day, generally speaking, a class is a means to generate an object. So you can generate an object through a function. You can generate an object uh, arbitrarily through um, maybe some form of reflection. Uh, there's so many different ways to generate an object, a class being one of them. So when I look at JavaScript, is JavaScript, right now JavaScript ES or ECMA ES5, uh, old school JavaScript now, uh, what is that? It, it's a complete mess, but what can it be? Is it a class-oriented language or is it a functional language? And then mm -hmm. that's when you th that's when you get kind of into the philosophical aspects of how you perceive languages. And for me, JavaScript fell more into a functional language. That's why I try to do more closure script or pure script or Elm as opposed to maybe you know e uh, ECMA twenty sixteen or ES twenty sixteen or TypeScript. But that's it, it gets it, you start delving into the depths of what where you want to see the language go. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let's talk up a little bit about the 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 mindset and the thinking about people who do well as polyglots and people who don't. Uh, do you think that people use the base language that they start from uh, and then look for parallels and they say, "Oh, well, this." This structure, this language construct in language foo is like, is like C sharp because I speak that. Or if they started with JavaScript or they learned a particular language first, they would set themselves up for success more than if they learned another language. Yes. And that's exactly how I approached it. So with C sharp being my first language, um, I went to Ruby and I tried to write, it's a, it's a part of growing with the language, but I tried to write C sharp and Ruby. So um, I was like, oh, I'm going to create an IOC container for Ruby. And only after a while did I realize, well, dependency injection is a thing in Ruby, and you can do that, but you don't need an IOC container in Ruby. So that was one of those things where you you, you get some growing pains, and then you, your mind starts bending and opening up to um, different different approaches to a language. And that it's it's good and bad. You bring the baggage, but also you bring the perspective. So then when you go back to your language, you can you can speak to you you can speak in different ways or in different contexts. Uh, I like to compare it to uh, let's say um, so in Urdu, that's another language that I speak. Um, uh, this is a, we, it, to be clear, Urdu is a language language, not a programming language. Yes, it's a language of Pakistan. Yeah, Urdu is a language language, and um, inter interestingly enough, it's like Hindi, except it uses the uh, Arabic alphabet set as opposed to the Hindi alphabet set. So when mm -hmm. someone says they can speak in Hindi, I can understand them for the most part, unless, they use, unless they're doing extremely, you know, Thesis level, right. doctrine yeah, level, esoteric. Hindi speaking, yeah, esoteric Hindi. I can I can converse with them, but when when uh, talking about family members, um, there are very specific ways that you introduce a family member. So it's not like oh, this is my uncle, this is my aunt. You would you would introduce them as oh, this is my father's youngest brother, or mm. or my wife's brother brother in law's sister. There's there's very specific words for for denoting. Um, one person or another. So when you get, to, so just from me understanding, uh, understanding Urdu, I have a, I have, I guess, almost a, a underlying appreciation for the relationships different family members have as opposed to just being an aunt or uncle. And I think that that holds true for languages also. When you start looking at different languages, some uh, suddenly uh, it means something to say, oh, this is a singleton method or this is a class method or an instance method as opposed to just a static method or a, or a, or a uh, object uh, method on a class. So those, those things you bring back and you're able to explore a bit more. The the does the par is the parallel really a good parallel between speaking a a speaking a language a, a human language and learning and and quote unquote speaking a programming language because like I feel like I speak like a child in Spanish so then if I learn Python I feel like I will be speaking like a child for for a while until it clicks. I, I think there is parallel primarily uh, if if not if not at the syntactical level like speaking and forming sentences. 
Um, once you start getting into the aspect of why does this language exist or why do people code in this language, you start getting into the deeper aspects of the philosophy of the language itself. So, you know, like with Urdu, there is a heavy emphasis on, on maybe familial bonds. Or I think Mandarin has a very specific means of saying something's in the future. So you can't, you can't just say, oh, I'll eventually do this. You have to be very specific or you can be more specific about when you plan to do this. And, uh, I think that makes, makes them, uh, people that know Mandarin probably better savers because they are better planners because they know they have to be more specific about those things. So when, when I look at a language, it, yeah, there's some, some syntactical aspects of it and those things grow with, uh, grow with time as you learn, uh, as you use the language more. So yeah, you'll start off with very simple sentences. You may, uh, expand on that, but, uh, focusing in on, why that language exists or what's the philosophy, what's idiomatic about this language. Uh, I think that really helps. Um, uh, there's a, there's a great talk by Rich Hickey called Simple Made Easy. It's about closure and, um, he talks about closure a little bit in, in there, but he speaks to why closure. Why is it, why did he build the language? What's idiomatic about it? Um, you have Matsumoto who did, uh, Ruby. He cares about, you know, developer happiness. That was one of the reasons why he developed that language and how is that conveyed through the language itself. So there's a community component to, to these kind of systems and these languages that exist. What do you say to people who have a fear that to learn these new languages? Because just like I'm ashamed to use my my Spanish in public because I will sound like I don't know what I'm doing, it can be a little overwhelming to see this amazing rich community of people speaking a language and then or or learning a programming language and then you know you're going to ask a dumb question. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, we un we underestimate ourselves as a developer uh, as developers and. I, it's a, I think a aspect of empowerment saying that, you know, it's okay. You'll learn the language. It's a different paradigm. Uh, there's, don't feel defeated and just work with it. You're a professional. You're really smart, especially if you're a developer. Um, chances are you're smarter than the, uh, a, a regular human being. At least I, I'd like to think so. So, you know, don't, don't sell yourself, self short from that standpoint and just be open to it. Like a, an example, that, that, uh, I've, I've really struggled with personally is trying to convey, you know, someone picking up, picking up F sharp if they know C sharp. And again, just, just for the audience, uh, that may be listening to this. Um, I know a lot of people emphasize the F sharp aspect of it saying, oh, it's a functional language. That's why you want to learn it. Maybe a different, a different premise would be, well, think of F sharp as providing more of a spectrum to, uh, to options that you may not find in C sharp. So in C sharp, you have value types and you have reference types. You can create a class, you can create a value type, and you can create an extension method. But that's kind of your your spectrum. In F sharp, you have a bit of an evolution. You can you can create a value type. You can create a tuple. You can create a discriminated union, which is a little bit more complex. You can create you can create um, a record type, which is another step in that spectrum. And you can create a class. Which is the final, final step. It's like bringing the cannon to a, to a gunfight, maybe. But that evolutionary aspect is intrinsic in the language, and it's going to be intrinsic in yourself learning a specific language. Same thing with Ruby. You start with the bare class that has one method, uh, uh, just a line in there, you know, puts hello world. Then you create a function, and it's a bare method. It hangs off a kernel. You don't, you don't have to know that while using it, but you can just create a bare method. And then you create a module. And then you create a class, so that evolution exists, and you'll find you'll find those uh, evident. You'll find that kind of evidence or those aspects of the language where it will let you start small and then grow with it. Where do you think people should start? Is there an ideal first language? It's it's dependent on what language you already know. So for C sharp, if you know C sharp, uh, learn a statically typed functional language. F sharp is familiar from the perspective you can use the BCL. That's a great language to get into. Um, then you might want to try maybe Objective C, just to kind of see um, what a message-based uh, language looks like. It's still kind of statically typed, but you know it gives you an option to kind of explore uh, message passing and how to, how that works. If you're a Ruby developer, uh, I wouldn't recommend C Sharp. Maybe JavaScript, uh, just to see a weakly typed language that has some functional components. Um, if you know JavaScript. Suddenly, you know, TypeScript, ES2016, PureScript, those all become options. So there's, there's that 
progression, that familiarity that you have to you have to be a part of to to um, really really work towards. Um, so yeah, if you're a C sharp developer, Ruby probably wouldn't be the best language to learn right off the bat because there's so many differences there. And um, it's it's a matter of finding that progression. I'll, I have an actual uh, a link or a gist that kind of has uh, pads to learning a new language, and I'll mm-hmm. and I'll put I'll, I'll give that to you so you can share that in your in your show notes. But um, yeah, it really depends on what language you're coming from. How much is the language and how much is the environment? Because sometimes I find I'll spend more time with the how to bring in new libraries and how to figure out how Python you know, where Python puts all its stuff. Yeah, I think um, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of online online information. I think that's seriously helped it. Uh, the Linux subsystem on Windows 10, I think that's going to help leaps and bounds on people picking up a new language. Uh, it's it is a component though. Um, when I first started learning Ruby, that was the first time I've ever been out of Visual Studio. So uh, I went whole hog and went Vim uh, against my better judgment, but I did it. And I and Vim I, the editor. Yeah, Vim the editor. Vim the editor, and then. A Vim the editor was great. I now use Emacs, uh, which is again a whole other story. But I still use Vim bindings, so the motion keys and the ability to manipulate languages um, through that consistent set of uh, bindings made it a lot easier. Uh, but yeah, there's it's there are pain points, and you just kind of have to work through them. And you might want to pick an editor that's that has quote unquote batteries included, like Sublime. Um, Atom, uh, electron based editor like VS Code, those things will help. But it, there's a growing pain there, and you just kind of have to work with it uh, as you mm-hmm. as you go through. Um, so when you say batteries included, you're saying find you know, decide how much hand holding you want your editor to do for you to yes. choose the language yes, and the exactly. environment. Do, um, do you want it to hide things from you, or do you want to learn those things and then choose to have them hidden from you? Right, and and know that know that eventually uh, eventually you'll. Depending, well, I guess depending on how you think, you may want to dig into how the editor works or really fine tune it. That's kind of my progression to, you know, why I use a ridiculous editor like Emacs, um, because that's kind of how my brain works. I like to tinker. And that was the one editor that let me tinker at a very, very, uh, all the way down, right? Tur- uh, at the, at the lowest level. I can change, you know, key bindings and make them do ridiculous things and, and actually code my editor from that standpoint. Uh, but it's it's one of those things that will help. It. So one thing, learn an editor that you can maybe take with you. I think uh, I think that can make things a lot easier. And then of course the Linux subsystem, uh, OS X, or just using a virtual machine, virtualized virtualized environments. All those things really help. So you're going to put together a list of. You said you have a gist that has some of your thoughts around this. Yes. Yeah. I have a gist of uh, basically evolution of like if I know language X, what would be a what language should I learn that I'll have a high success of, of actually being able to, you know, be proficient ah, in? So almost a language tree in the sense of exactly. I know Spanish, I should go and learn French now, as opposed to I, learn, I know Spanish, I should learn Chinese. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Interesting. That, that's actually would be an extremely useful thing, because I think that uh, there are people who decide to go from, you know, English to Finnish, and they are completely different languages, but if they took a couple of stepping stones, they might find their way to those languages uh, a little more easily. Yep. And it, from, from my perspective, it, it, it's there's an aspect of learning a language for the sake of learning the language. Uh, but I do, I do understand, I, I do empathize with the aspect of, you know, I'm not using this on my day job. It, it What benefit do I, does it really bring to me? And it's a component. You have to think about that. Is it really worth learning um, Swift if you're primarily doing backend, you know, .NET development, or is it worth learning uh, Ruby if all you're doing is mobile? It might not be worth it. Uh, so there's there's aspects that have to be away from that perspective. But generally speaking, I think learning a new language, especially in a different paradigm, uh, emphasis on that, um, makes you a better developer. It really does. It re- it lets you think differently. It lets you kind of. S- maybe even bring back some good things from that language um, or the ecosystem, just the tooling or um, the philosophies that they, that they have with, with a, a large swat of things, project structure, dependency management, et cetera, et cetera. So it, mm-hmm. I think it just makes you a better developer. And have you, have you found that as you got to the point where you are competent in multiple languages, that you're more likely to just 
dive into the next language? Yeah, it becomes much easier. It becomes really, really easy to get, jump into the ne- next language. The other, the downside is that you start hating every language too. <laughs> so you'll, you'll start looking at a language like, man, I wish it had, uh, you know, C sharps, uh, type inference or F sharps type inference or man, I wish, uh, I wish I, it was, wasn't so painful to create, you know, this POCO object or plain old CLR object or plain old object or, Oh, why can't reflection work a little bit better? Or, oh, reflection is too good. You know, all those different variations come into play then. And uh, so you start hating languages, all of them. You just start hating all of them. And you have multiple personality disorder. You have multiple personality disorder? Why do you say that? Yeah, yeah, you have, you have multiple personality disorder with languages. Um, there'll be situations where I'll be doing, uh, some, some C sharp code and I, I'll, I'll use dynamic, uh, and, I don't think about it now. It's like, oh, I'm just going to, you know, use the dynamic keyword here and use an expando object or something because I don't want to go with, I don't want to deal with making a type. And um, I don't think too much about what kind of other implications that could have uh, on the code base or people reading the code base. So it gets kind of weird. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I appreciate this. Uh, I, I hope that people who are listening, maybe who only know one language, will go and give it a try and pick something that is, uh, you know, me, um, possible. You know, yeah. they, they pick something that is, you know, if you know C sharp, maybe learn a little Java or learn a little Swift, something that is a, a friendly curly braced language and then move your way to another one. Yeah. And uh, I have a, I have a, just a quasi funny story or interesting story with regards to real languages or learning real languages. And, um, I, I find it interesting. I don't think it's in any way related, maybe, but, uh, during the colonization of, of India uh, with, uh, with, uh, British coming in, um, they would, they would come down and, you know, they'll have Indian servants that would, would cater to what, what they needed during that colonization period. And, uh, they didn't know Hindi at all. So there was, a, the, the interesting thing that came out was that you would have linguists that would train British people to speak an, uh, an English sentence and then quote unquote magically have someone that didn't speak English do something for them. So an example was, uh, when you say there was a brown crow, literally meaning there was a brown crow like a bird, um, someone would close the door or the servant would close the door for you because there was a brown crow is almost a cognate for darvaza bandkaro, which means close the door. And there was a cold day means, you know, was, there was a cold day, right? But it also means open the door in, in Hindi. So there were like these really interesting cognates almost or transitions between languages that you see and you kind of you, you kind of get a feel for for those kind of same corollaries between between one language to another one programming language to another so i figured that was just a nice story to tell it was it just interesting yeah so those kinds of things happen a lot they are confusing i, th- I think though that you've 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 tr- you've made me feel like i'll be able to go out there and be more bold and try new languages and maybe not be afraid to say like yeah. <laughs> Whatever, right? Just go for it. And just go for it. I think that's that's the other aspect of it. You know, it's explore. Um, there's plenty of information out there. And g- generally speaking, the communities are very helpful. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you uh, chatting with me today. Yep, definitely. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.